Welcome to Adeptus On Air, the show where we examine how individuals and companies make decisions that drive their business and personal success. Each week, we connect with notable professionals who pull back the curtain on the industries that Adeptus has been on the cutting edge of for the last 30 years, including music, sports, and entertainment, as well as new emerging markets. Hello, hello, hello. This is Mike Hoffman with another episode of Adept on Air. My guest today is Valerie Mayen. Valerie, good to talk to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. So Valerie has a very interesting uh, what I'll call professional life trajectory, which I want to discuss. But the important stuff first, you are a mango connoisseur. Yes. What does that entail? So, you know, mango is a very um, um, well-known and well-liked fruit. I would say it's like second to avocado, right? Um, but it's also very, it's, it's native to Central America and a lot of other, um, you know, warmer climate places. My family's from Central America. Um, they're everywhere in Mexico and there's different ways to eat them. And I, I grew up on them. Like I eat five of them a week. Like they're my oh, wow. favorite food. Yeah, they're great. I, they're like, uh, they're definitely a commodity and a, a, a very special uh, treasure in our house because m both my girls love them. My husband likes them enough, but he doesn't eat them right, so he wastes a lot of the meat of the fruit, and it drives me nuts. Um, so yeah, I'm, you know they're also kind of pricey, so like they're they're yeah. high value items in our home. But yeah, I know. My of one daughter. Oh, go ahead. Actually, <laughs> mango allergy. Oh, that stinks. That's really a bummer. Which we didn't realize until when she was like four or five. She got a fruit cup out of Fridays in Florida, and a few hours later, she had broken out. And we're like, what's in your fruit cup? Because she eats fruit all the time. And the only component they had that she hadn't had was mango. Oh, geez. And then we had her tested and sure enough. That's unfortunate. So we stay, we, we stay clear in our house. <laughs> so Valerie, you, you were on two seasons of Project Runway. Correct. So that sounds like an awesome experience. Yeah, I would say it, it's a lot of different kinds of experiences. Um, it was awesome. It was scary. It was super exciting. It was exhausting. It was terrifying. It was it was every emotion on the spectrum that you could feel. So what made you decide that that was something you wanted to do along your journey? You know, I really had no intention of doing it. Um, I'd only been sewing for about two years when I was approached by their casting director for a season seven, actually. Um, I'd only been sewing, or I think it was that year it was 2008 actually mm -hmm. and i i got pretty far in the process i was actually um called up to be an alternate in case someone backed out or canceled yeah. or got sick or died but none of those things happened so i didn't make it on a season seven and then next year in 2009 the casting director called me again and they were like hey we'd love for you to try again we think you'd be a shoe in and i almost didn't because it's, it's a lot of work you know you have to send in a lot of equip a lot of um mm -hmm. materials and there's a lot of interviews and you have to go to chicago or neighboring cities so it's just it's kind of um mildly cost prohibitive for young designers for me at the time it was you know i didn't have a lot of money i was just starting my career so um i think i was working five jobs to make ends meet wow. and you know it it was hard but i decided to do it anyway and and i got on the show so yeah, they they found me. I think on a website that I used to be selling on. I was I was only selling on like Etsy and I think mm -hmm. um, like Stars and Infinite Darkness was another indie designer website. And they found me there, and and that's kind of how it happened. But looking back, was the exposure and all the hard work worth it? Yeah, I would say so. I think I think it would definitely be. I would get a better return if I did it again now. Or if I mm -hmm. did it now instead of then, uh, for many reasons. I mean, one, I'd be a much more seasoned designer. I have a stronger voice and a clearer vision now. But two, yeah. social media has just, it, it's kind of the vehicle that really propels a lot of people forward in their mm -hmm. careers. And when I was on Project Runway, Instagram had not even really, it, it didn't start till, it didn't become a thing until 2011 or 2012. Right. And so we didn't really have the power of social media behind us to really like, um, you know, help launch our careers fully but but it definitely helped and i'm glad i did it i have a lot of clients now who are in the reality field the young actors and especially the ones who do reality tv they hear to after they get off the show they can leverage social media in so many ways to expand their 
their visibility or their 15 minutes of pain. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, because it really is 15 minutes. Like the minute our season is over, they're on to the next and people forget who you are because there's there's yeah. so many of us. I mean, I think they're right. in season 18 now, maybe. I don't even know. I've lost count. Yeah. Is it so you still follow? Not really, to be honest. Like I it's there's just so many fashion reality shows now, you know, like there's mm-hmm. Making the Cut, there's Next in Fashion, there's The Hype, there's Project Runway. There's just so many, it's hard to keep up and and I'm too busy with my kids and my business now that sure. it just, you know, other things take precedence. So you knew from an early age that fashion design was the way you wanted to go? Not really. Um, you know, I knew at an early age that I wanted to be in the creative industry. Like I'd Okay. Since I was five or four, I'd I'd been drawing. Um, I used to, you know, set up my Barbies and they were my, you know, my my life forms that I would draw from. And then sometimes my sisters mm-hmm. would sit for me, but they really hated it and they couldn't do it for very long. Yeah. And then I used to draw, I would always try to to draw the covers of um Disney VHS tapes, you know, like when I was a kid, I was born in the eighties, you know, nineteen eighty one. Um, mm-hmm. and VHS tapes were the thing. And so when Disney came out with Little Mermaid and um Lady and the Tramp and yep. King, like I would try really hard to always um I would, you know, draw them on paper, like from from sight, from you know, just by looking at it. And then I used to draw pictures for my friends in school and I would charge them like I think a quarter or fifty cents a drawing. And that so that's kind of how I entered into the creative entrepreneur world, I guess, when I was like in grade school and middle school. Um, but I really didn't know what it would come to because in my family, you know, being a conservative Latin American family or what I came from anyway, um, Mm -hmm. you know, you typically either became a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher, or you got married, you know? And so it was just a very typical traditional path because my parents wanted us to find strong, stable, regular, typical jobs so that Mm -hmm. we could have the things that they couldn't have. Um, as immigrants, you know, so I think that's yeah. that's what I thought my path was, and I didn't think that being a creative business was an option. Yeah, but you kind of now, which which we'll move to in a second, you have the creative side, but you turned it into a business, you know, as well. Yeah, I didn't see any other way to be able to pursue what I loved without being able to monetize it because I I mm-hmm. needed to survive, and I I didn't want to just survive and exist. I wanted to be greater than that. You know, I wanted to yeah. to really live. So after you do, so now. You do the show, and then you dabble in acting a little bit as well. Oh, um, yeah, that was kind of a happenstance, yeah. Um, I definitely don't consider myself an actor or actress. Right. Um, I used to compete in, like, drama prose competitions when I was mm-hmm. in high school, but that was just because I loved to compete, and I was an overachiever sure. and a middle child, and I craved attention, right? So definitely now I, I don't think I would – uh trust myself to be able to make a living that way. But uh, it was when I was right off Project Runway, there was a, a local director here that was making a movie and he happened mm-hmm. to be able to get a big name or not a big ish name. I would say like a, like a B-list celebrity, Busy mm-hmm. Phillips was on it. And so he was like, yeah. hey, I'd love for you to you know, play this small part in one of the vignettes. And so, so yeah, I was like, why not? You know, um, but that, that was it. That was I it. actually, I know Busy Phillips is, I, I, I've seen several of her things. Definitely much bigger now than she was then so i, I definitely think yeah. that helped his i think she was in that show with uh like courtney cox at one point like at cougar, I think town? cougar town yeah 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 i like her she's pretty funny yeah she's she's definitely pretty funny so you go from project runway you, you do the acting thing a little bit and then your your career trajectory how did it turn and work towards where you are now i would say my career definitely started taking a little bit um more of a, uh, I would say, a, a growth phase. It kind of hit a growth phase or it took a more uh, serious turn, I think, when I would say maybe like right after I had my first daughter. I mean, before that, I was kind of running my business by the seat of my pants, right? Like, I didn't know mm-hmm. what I was doing. I, I was just, you know, I'd make a dress, sell a dress, buy more fabric, make more dresses, sell more dresses, you know? Um, I mean, and I was, how were you selling them at that point? So when I first started, I was selling on Etsy only, you know, um, mm-hmm. I actually started with outerwear. I, I read a book by Manolo Blahnik, right? He's you know a famous shoe designer. Most people know mm-hmm. him from Sex and the City. He's like the iconic, you know, shoe couturier. So 
I read a book that he wrote. Uh, he actually was a costume designer before he became Manolo Blahnik. And he he was so conflicted because he loved doing lots of things because he was so talented and creative. And so his mentor, you know, told him, hey, if you really want to be successful and you really want to be great, you need to find one thing that you love and that you're good at and be, become the master of it, right? Mm -hmm. So I loved making clothes. I just started to learn and I, I loved it so much that it, it, it agreed with me. I learned it fast and I was I became good at it fast. But I noticed that when I tried selling dresses on Etsy, it would take me a whole month to sell one dress. And I was selling it at like half of the price I should have been selling it at. But that was kind of the threshold I could get for a handmade dress in 2009, mm -hmm. right? And so I kind of racked my brain a bit and I was like, well, I live in Cleveland, right? Cleveland is the tundra of the Midwest. And, you know, women are very particular about how they buy and what they buy and when they buy and how much they're going to spend. And women typically will spend more money on a utility functional clothing or accessory than they will on, say, a typical everyday piece of clothing. So women don't like to spend a lot of money on dresses or everyday wear because they don't want to be seen in those dresses all the time. Um, but a, a purse or a coat is considered more of a utility item that they are going to wear mm -hmm. all the time. They're going to keep for more than three years. So I knew I could get a higher price point for the coats if I made them. and. I was in the right geographical region for them and I really enjoyed making them and designing them and really kind of engineering them to be more interesting and unique and really um, special. Mm -hmm. So that's what I started with. And when I started making coats, I was selling like one a day and wow. it was, it was night and day from dresses to coats. And so I was like, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. I'll be the master of outerwear. And, and so, yeah, that's to this day, outerwear is really like the, 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 our bread and butter, um, but mm -hmm. we also do a lot of other things too. We make, you know, um, dresses and jumpsuits and accessories, but but outerwear is our forte. So this business on Etsy, mm -hmm. how did it progress off of Etsy? Uh, yeah, so as I, well, after I did Project Runway, I decided to kind of move off Etsy because Etsy at that point was becoming really saturated and it mm -hmm. wasn't really, you know, uh, an, uh, an integrity-based platform like it, it wasn't really curating handmade it was like handmade with things mass produced and with supplies and with things bought and resold you know so it was kind of becoming mm -hmm. a bit convoluted so I just decided it was best to create my own website and start my own kind of marketing trajectory to build my own brand and after Project Runway I decided you know I needed to really ride the wave as long as I could right so I had a friend who was active as my business manager and at that time I was getting emailed and you know, petitioned and, and solicited and asked by everyone and their mom to either judge a competition or speak mm -hmm. at a school or, you know, appear at this event or be in this, you know, webisode. And um, it just got to the point where I couldn't manage it and I was doing too many things for free. So I hired a friend who I knew was like real assertive and didn't mm -hmm. take shit from anyone. And she, you know, acted as my business manager and she, she and I worked the circuit as long as we could, you know, we, we, made some decent money that year just focusing on getting my name out being more visible mm -hmm. trying to really establish myself as the the authority on fashion and sewing in cleveland or in the midwest and and we rode that way for a couple of years and then that's kind of how i was able to start my business and you know have a storefront and get some more data on who my client was what price points i could charge what items they wanted and and you know kind of took off in that way so you have both a storefront and online sales now um, at that point, I did. Um, well, I, yeah. I had online sales, but I wasn't proactively pursuing it very well. Mm -hmm. I really sucked at e-commerce at the time. And sure. I just didn't see the need for it because I was so good at in-person sales. Like, I, that's kind mm -hmm. of like I could sell like ice to an Eskimo, right? Like, I am I love it. I'm good at it. And I think I'm good at it in the way where I can find the thing that a person needs and help fill their need as opposed to just selling them crap that they don't need. Like, I, mm -hmm. I strongly believe and I really prefer and love to sell people, women especially, the things that I know will help improve their lives. It will help them achieve more in their careers. That's that's my goal and mission, and I love it. Mm -hmm. um, but e-commerce kind of handicaps me in that way, and I just didn't know a lot about it. And so we didn't pursue it for quite a long time until like literally until COVID. <laughs> now, the name of your place is the Yellow Cake Shop, correct? Yep. Okay. I'm sure you've been asked this before. Yep. 
So you want to answer it before I even ask it. Sure. So Yellow Cake Shop is in no way any reference to uranium or sulfur. We get a lot of older gentlemen who might have served in Vietnam or, um, you know, maybe just the older generation who understands what that means. Um, but for us, it doesn't mean that. Um, I actually called named it Yellow Cake uh, because when, when I started the company, I actually started it because I had to. Um, I was a nanny for this family in Pepper Pike who was very well-to-do. They actually own several large companies and banks in Cleveland. And mm -hmm. I loved the kids. I loved my job, but I wasn't crazy about the uh, the parents. They were just like a little intense and they were, mm -hmm. I was there from 10 a.m. to midnight. It was just killing me. So I found another job and I put in my two weeks and I quit the nanny job that I wasn't crazy about. And then my other job fell through and I didn't have a job for like five months. And I was living off ramen and I was really freaking out and... I finally found another nannying job for a family that actually is I'm still connected to today. They're like my second family. Um, but when I was doing that, I talked to some friends from where I took a few sewing classes and they were like, why don't you just sell the things you made in school? And you like, you're really good at this. Why don't you sell them on Etsy? And so that's how I started the company is because I had to, not because I wanted to, or because I was like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. It's just, I, I needed money. And mm -hmm. so it was really kind of out of necessity. Um, but yeah, I, but, that's kind of how Yellow Cake came to be. You know, we were thinking about it and my friends were like, oh, well, you know, what about Yellow Cake? Because it's fun and it's whimsical. And, you know, you could definitely parlay that into some really cool, um, you know, mission and underlying meaning of what, what it means to you, right? So for me, as a middle child, right, um, I, I often feel like growing up, I felt like I didn't get the attention my sisters did. I always felt a little bit ignored or left behind. Um, it's middle child syndrome is totally standard. Jan Brady, I get it. Hey, right, yeah, totally Jan Brady. <laughs> Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. So, <laughs> you know, yellow cake is kind of the stepchild of desserts, right? It's the forgotten mm -hmm. favorite. Um, everyone loves chocolate cake. There's no death by yellow cake or yellow cake mm -hmm. lava cake on a menu, right? Um, and so because we, as a slow fashion company, which is, you know, slow fashion is a, a company that's focused on um, creating clothing garments responsibly, ethically, honestly, and with more intent and purpose on making products that are built to last instead of products that are disposable, like, you know, fast fashion, which is H&M, Zara, Forever 21, Shein. Mm -hmm. Those companies are really more focused on dollars, bottom line, which I get. That's the whole point of a business. But they're not at all concerned with the human capital that they are uh, marginalizing. They're not at all concerned with the, um, you know, the the. Uh, environmental effects of their businesses and how that affects the communities that they produce in. Um, there's just so much wrong with fast fashion. So for us, we believe in prioritizing women and women of color in who we hire, vendors that we support, um, the way we run our business. And we really do feel like women have long been kind of the the second class citizen of our of our community of mm -hmm. country and and we just really felt like that was our way of subtly saying that this is who we are, this is what we support. And, and as the underdog, we we really believe that that's what we want to be and be for. So it's it's a long way around of, you know, saying we came to be Yellow Cake because we didn't want it to be like fashion for a change. Yeah. Or design for good. Like we didn't want it to be like a Sally Struthers commercial and hitting you over the head mm -hmm. with it. We wanted it to be simple <laughs> and subtle. Yeah. You know, like we just don't want people we, we want people to be educated, but we're not here mm -hmm. to like get on our soapbox and make them feel bad for buying right. you know, their underwear at Target, right? Like I'm I'm a more of a, a realist, not an idealist or a purist. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm I'm all about doing what we can with what we have and just trying to do better every day, just trying to improve. Once we yeah. know more, let's do better, you know? Yeah. So you mentioned that people get your name confused with, obviously, the example you gave. I actually initially thought you were a bakery. So that was my, that's why when I said, you know where I'm going, yeah. that's where I thought you were going to take me. It, when I saw cake, and then, so I was looking at the website, studying up a little bit. I'm like, this doesn't look like something that uh, right. you, you'd get at a bakery. Sure. But your designs are beautiful. Thanks. So, so very nice. Now, Everything is designed by you or do you have a team now? So I design everything. I'm the head mm -hmm. designer. No one else designs the products, the garments. Um, no one else decides what gets produced and when and what colors. I order. The, I, I choose the textiles. I choose the trim, the notions. I choose most everything about them. Um, and I've made almost all of the patterns for all of our products or the base patterns for our new products. Because typically our newer products are just made with the initial patterns that I've made and we modify mm -hmm. them. Um, but as I grew, you know, I, I realized very early on that 
like I think in my first year, I, I couldn't, I was capping my potential. I was capping my income by choosing to be the only person that made everything. Like, like again, I'm a realist. I'm not a purist. And there are some artists that are like, it, everything must touch my hands, you know? And yes, I can respect that. But I'm also in business to stay in business. I'm in business mm -hmm. to create jobs. I'm in business to create generational wealth for my family. You know, yes. as a Latin American woman, like that, that's not something that I have. You know, my parents are immigrants and they made money and saved money like immigrants, which is pretty much non-existent. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that was important to me. Um, so for me, I realized that if I wanted to grow and expand and scale, I had to hire people. So I basically, you know, train sewers that I can find locally here in Cleveland or in Chicago even. There's, there's a few we work with there that have been great for us. We do a lot of business mm -hmm. in Chicago, so it made sense. And, um, you know, we, we work with them as best as we can, and we train them on the styles that we know they can make based on their skill level. It seems like, and this is, I think, a pretty good compliment that most of what you're doing is self-taught. Yeah, I would so say. You're, so be, besides the fashion aspect of it, you're running a business, which comes with a whole nother set of knowledge and things like that. So how did you navigate through that over the past five, six years? Uh, yeah, I would say the first seven years of the business, I was just kind of like winging it. You know, I was like, mm -hmm. okay. And I, I really did not believe in credit cards because I had a horrible experience with them right out of college. Mm -hmm. And I was, once I got my debt paid off, I was like, never again. And so yeah. I just knew that I could only make and build and grow with what I could spend of my own money. Um, you know, it was really important to me that I wasn't beholden to anyone, that I did it myself. Um, and if I needed a loan, that I would pay it back immediately. But luckily, I didn't have mm -hmm. to do that. So, you know, I'd buy some materials and I would try to find it at the best price possible. You know, I'm, my mom is Mexican. My dad is sent, you know, from Guatemala. So I'm very scrappy. <laughs> like I just, mm -hmm. I can, I can negotiate the hell out of a lot of things and I do it not to be greedy and not to be, you know, mis miserable. I, I, I do it, you know, to make sure I can get the best price to provide the best product, to be able to make the best margin, to be able to create the best jobs with the best pay and provide the most approachable product for our clients. So I don't just do it for me. I do it for everyone else that's, part that's touching this process. So um, yeah, I, I kind of taught myself a lot. I read a lot of books. Um, my dad is an entrepreneur, so I think maybe I gleaned some of that from him. Um, he's pretty shrewd and pretty tenacious. And I would say I'm, I'm probably pretty similar to that. Um, and then it wasn't really till I think 2017, when I received a, um, uh, an invitation to work with Jumpstart, which is a local uh, small business incubator. And mm -hmm. Before 2017, Jumpstart had really only focused on um, tech businesses, and they really had not done a lot of outreach to increase their diversity. There was not a lot of businesses mm -hmm. owned by people of color. So they started getting into businesses that were food concepts and retail and light manufacturing. And so they approached me, and um, we met the qualifications for the program, and we did what was called an impact program. And so it was me and four of the businesses. We were in this cohort for 12 weeks. And at the end of those 12 weeks, we had to pitch to this panel of judges. And then one of us got 10,000, the rest got 2,500. Essentially, we were being paid to improve and learn about our business. And mm -hmm. that really helped me see some things that I hadn't seen before. Like I was like, what the hell is a competitive matrix? And I had no idea I needed a valuation process. And yeah, we have a yeah. mission statement, but it's definitely not looking like this, you know? So there was so much that I didn't know, even like setting goals and creating a budget. Like I never did that in my mind, as long as the lights were on and I had groceries yeah. in my fridge, that was good enough for me. Mm -hmm. So you, when you talk about budgets and goals, what's the five year to 10 year plan of your business? Um, five year plan is to, well, actually, I would say in the next two and a half years, we'd like to hit a million in sales. That's our goal. Okay. I think we're about three quarters of the way there. Um, and then in five years, we'd like to be hopefully at the multi-million threshold, um, 10 years, I'd like to possibly slowly exit the company. Cause I mean, mm -hmm. I've been doing this now for 13 plus years. Yeah. Um, I'd like to exit the company. I, I think I'll still stay on as a consultant or maybe a mm -hmm. board member, but I really would like to train and groom someone to become the COO. And then, um, I personally would like to continue in, um, small business, commercial real estate and some other things that I really enjoy and, and finding that I might be good at. So you're still in the in area? I'm still in the what? Sorry. Cleveland area? Mm -hmm. I'm still in the Cleveland area. Yeah. Um, I've lived here for almost, uh, say I moved here in 2002. So yeah, um, 21 mm -hmm. years now. Now, I, I, I believe I read something about you take this on the road sometimes to different conferences. And, you know, I think a lot of them that are 
women focused. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, talk about that process in terms of where you decide it's worthwhile for you to kind of travel. Yeah, I would say the biggest thing for us that was a huge revelation and a major catalyst for our business was really discovering who our target market was, like who was the YC woman, right? Who is our our avatar? And at first I used to base that on me. Like I was like, okay, if I like it and I would wear it, then we'll make it, right? But as I got older, um, and our, our clients also grew up with us, right? I was 28, I think, when I started the company, 27, and I'm 42 now, right? So, you know, it was interesting because as I grew up, my taste changed, you know, I wanted mm -hmm. to become less whimsical and colorful and i wanted to become a little bit more sophisticated and minimal and i noticed our clients were wanting that more too and so we used to do a lot of small you know outdoor events like you know the cleveland flea or small craft markets um but it wasn't until i think it was 2016 actually we were invited to um, by this group called women in transactions they're part of another group called association for corporate growth and it's basically a group of women who are all in finance mergers acquisitions investments banking like really mm -hmm. wealthy women who are kicking ass in their careers, right? They're like the head honcho of what they do. And so they invited me to speak at one of their small women's events and have a small runway show. And they paid me to be there. They paid me really well. And then they said, hey, we'd love for you to have a pop-up shop for a couple hours. Now, before that, we had been doing the Cleveland Flea, right? And we did the Cleveland Flea and there was, I would say 10,000 people came through there in like two days, right? And we'd be out yeah. there under the hot sun for eight hours each day. And maybe we'd gross about five to 7,000, which isn't bad for a local event. But when we did this event with Women in Transactions, we were there for two hours with 100 women and we made almost seven grand. And I was like, this is our client. Like the women who need wardrobe to accommodate their busy schedule. They need a wardrobe mm -hmm. that's comfortable, but professional. They have the budget to afford our price point and pay us what mm -hmm. we know we're worth. And they love it. It's, it's their niche, it's their style. And so that's when we decided, yeah, the professional working woman, she's our client. So we just started going after events where those women were like, if, you know, there's a conference for women in finance, we're there. If there's a, an event for the, you know, lawyers, uh, the Cleveland Metro Bar Association, we're there. If there's a summit for small businesses and entrepreneurs who are leveling up, we're there. So that's really kind of how we did it. I mean, we still do a few, like I would say, I wouldn't call them craft shows. They're more um, like artist showcases, like mm -hmm. the one of a kind show yeah. in Chicago. We love that show. It's our best show of the year, hands down. Um, you know, and we, we do things like that still, but we really are focusing on pursuing wherever the professional women are that can afford our, our pieces and can appreciate what we do. That's where we go. I think it's great that not only you have a product you're passionate about, but you kind of have a cause you know, at, at the same time. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't think I'd be able to do this if I didn't. Yeah. Well, that's great. Cause a lot of people don't have that. A lot of people, and you refer to some of those other companies, as long as they're making money, the cause is irrelevant. Right. For having a cause is irrelevant. Oh yeah. It, their cause is putting money in my pocket. Sure. Right. And like, I, I can totally respect that. And mm -hmm. ultimately our cause is to help women achieve more. That's definitely our why, mm -hmm. but we're going to achieve our bottom line and the success we want by continuing to pursue that why. Like mm -hmm. that's why Apple is so successful because their why is, you know, to, to provide really great products to live people, for people to live life. Right. And, mm -hmm. and that's why they succeed. And so for us, like even simple things like pockets, that's the number one thing our client says about our product. They're like, and it has pockets and we put pockets in everything. There is not a single piece we make that does not have pockets. Minimum mm -hmm. two, maximum five. And it's something that's so small for a lot of big companies, I think, but it's so big for the consumer. Women have often felt they're, like they're not seen if a garment doesn't mm -hmm. have pockets. But you look at like a little toddler boy's pair of pants and it's got like three pockets. How is it mm -hmm. that a baby needs more pockets than a working woman, you know, right. often because of just the way things came up. And I hate to sound like uber, you know, leftist feminist, but that's kind of how things came up in the patriarchy, right? Like women were not provided with pockets in their garments because it was a form of control because women weren't allowed to carry the pocketbook. They were seen as people that didn't need to you know, handle financial affairs. And so it was never mm -hmm. of any importance. And then right. when it came to the point where we could have pockets, a lot of fashion companies, big fashion companies are owned by men. And so they don't consider it because every seam costs more money. So if they're gonna have to add two more seams times two, four more seams to a garment, and it's gonna cost them even two or three or $5 more, they're not gonna add it because it's gonna affect the line. So we really take into account what our client needs and wants 
so that they can succeed because that will make their day easier. A happy customer is a returning customer. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So how can people uh, check out your stuff online? So yeah, they can find us many ways. The The prime way obviously is through our website. It's uh, yellowcakeshop.com, all one word, just like the dessert. And it's the American spelling of shop, not the British spelling, one P. So yellowcakeshop.com is our website. Uh, you can also find us on Instagram. Our handle is at yellowcakeshop, same spelling. Uh, we're on Facebook as well, under Yellow Cake Shop. So it's pretty simple to find us. Awesome. Listen, it was really interesting talking to you. I, I wish you nothing but continued success. And uh, I'd like to hear from you from time to time. Let us know how you're doing. Totally. Yeah, it was great. I love talking with you too. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Adeptus On Air. If you like this episode, please subscribe and leave a review. If you have a question related to this episode or have a request for what you would like to hear, please email us at marketing at adeptuscpas.com. You can also find us at adeptuscpas.com online or follow us at Adeptus on social media. The views and opinions by the podcast speakers and guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Adeptus. This podcast provides general information only and is not intended to constitute advice.